Welcome everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson and I'm your host for the 2022 Field of Fork webinar series. It's our seventh webinar series and we're really glad you joined today. Spring is coming so we are all looking forward to gardening I think. The next slide shows our upcoming webinars. On March 9th, Shannon Coleman, an assistant professor and extension food safety specialist at Iowa State University, will be visiting with us about honey and its safety and use. And on the 16th, yours truly, uh, Julie, will be hosting a webinar about food waste from storing food to composting. The next slide shows our webinar controls. Because of the large number of participants, we've actually had over 500 register for this series. We are inviting you to post your comments in the chat. So let's practice a little and find the chat box. Click to open the chat and then type your city and state in the chat box. And while you're doing that, I wanted to let you know that we have enabled closed captioning. So on your control panel, you should see a place where you can go and um, show those closed captions. So you can get a play-by-play -play on what we're saying. So you can continue to um, type your, your city and state. And the next slide provides an acknowledgement. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I will ask all of you to take a couple minutes to complete a short online survey that will be emailed to you right after today's webinar. As a thank you, I have many prizes available to the lucky winners of the random drawings, but I need to ask you to be sure to put your complete address on the follow-up form, including your city, state, and zip code, because we do have people from all over the North Central region participating and beyond that. And finally, I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker. Barb Ingham is a professor of food science and extension food safety specialist for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research group is currently studying the process interventions that affect the safety of fresh and fresh cut produce. And in the spring and summer and fall, Barb and her family enjoy both gardening and biking around the Midwest. So welcome, Barb, and it's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. It's great to be here today. I hope um, everyone on today had a chance to listen to Tom last week. We're going to hit some of the highlights of what um, we did discuss last week um, and put them in a slightly different context, I guess, if you want to say. And then we're going to talk a lot about um, once you have harvested all this safe and healthy produce, um, what do we, how do we store it so that it's going to be available to us uh, for a period of time. So I'm going to start by setting the context, and that is um, looking at just incidents of foodborne illness in the United States. About 48 million Americans become sick from a foodborne illness every year. Um, this would be about one in every six individuals. So depending on the size of your family um, or your extended family, you would anticipate um, an estimated one of you, if there are six of you, um, would be sick with a foodborne illness every year. Um, about 128,000 of those every year are hospitalized and an estimated 3,000 die as a result. These are preventable deaths. And that's one reason we talk about it, especially if we're talking about safety of produce. So the cost to the US economy is an estimated $80 billion every year. And we have parts of our population that are, are much more vulnerable, much more likely to um, end up hospitalized or potentially even to die from a foodborne illness. And these are uh, young children. These are the elderly, those 65 and older, um, pregnant women, and those who have compromised immune systems. These might be people uh, that are undergoing uh, cancer treatment or something like that. So where their immune systems might be working just a little bit differently. So I'd like to put that into perspective um, and look at um, 
how does fresh produce contribute to what we know about foodborne illness in the United States? So here's some data. It's, it is a little bit outdated, but it's the most recent that we have available to us. Um, so the period of 2004 to 2013, and you'll see here um, along the, the, what, the axis here at the very bottom, we've got a whole different number of type of foods um, that may perhaps be linked to foodborne illness outbreaks. Um, on the, on the left-hand side here, we have number of outbreaks. An outbreak is at least two people um, getting sick from a, a single food source. And then on the right-hand side here, we have numbers of illnesses. Uh, linked to those outbreaks. So the height of the bar, the blue bar, is the number of outbreaks linked to that particular food item. In the first case here, we have a multi-ingredient non-meat item that might be something like a vegetable lasagna. So it's got a lot of things in it, but perhaps not meat in this case. So we have numbers of outbreaks based on the height of the bar. And then the number of illnesses that are tied to that outbreak are this is this kind of um, um, maybe orange or brown dot here. And I've circled produce because um, that might be a little bit surprising to some of us where if we look at this continuum, we see produce bar is one of the highest um, that we have. It also has a very high number of illnesses um, tied to that. So again, a reason why when we talk about produce safety, we're kind of putting this into context. Um, the next slide here is just some trending data. I have some data that's a little bit more current. So I wanted to, to share the information slightly differently. So here we have two different time frames, 2004 to 2010. That's part of the, the, um, the time frame that we saw for the previous data. And then 2010 to 2017, we have uh, the actual number of produce outbreaks over those two uh, different periods, the number of illnesses associated with each, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of deaths. So you'll notice within these um, two periods of time that the number of produce outbreaks did increase actually quite significantly. Um, we'll also notice that that there were more outbreaks in the more recent time frame where we had multiple states involved, multiple states uh, reporting cases of foodborne illnesses tied to that outbreak. So rather than something being localized to Wisconsin, where I live, um, there may have been people that were sickened in this foodborne outbreak in North Dakota and Minnesota, as well as Wisconsin and other states. So that's one of the trends that we notice. So increasing numbers of outbreaks, uh, increasing uh, percentage of those that were linked to uh, multiple states involved. Kind of, you know, relatively consistent number of illnesses dropped, but not significantly. More hospitalizations, that's not a good trend. We don't like to see that. And a lot more deaths um, in the more recent time frame. So these are things for us to be aware of when we start talking about fresh produce, produce that we grow in our garden. We're also normally, especially here in the upper Midwest, where there's not a lot of fresh produce that may be available to us um, this time of year, where what we have um, maybe held over from the from the growing season, we're, we're, we're beginning to be out of those things, and other maybe squashes, potatoes, you might have, but a lot of things that we love to eat, uh, we don't have available to us fresh grown right here uh, locally. So we're purchasing at the grocery store, these trends are consistent with that as well. So there's lots of different organisms that we know that are associated with these um, foodborne illness outbreaks, some of them you'll probably have heard about, salmonella, we all, I think many of us have heard about that. Um, Listeria, uh, another pathogenic E. coli. The top three that we're seeing in this second time frame here were E. coli 0157H7 and other pathogenic E. coli. Um, Listeria monocytogenes, which is a problematic, uh, and then um, salmonella. So um, things terms that we sometimes hear in the news um, related to foodborne illness outbreaks. And, and uh, one last slide here with some, with some trend data, um, produce pathogen combinations. So, you know, we've had numbers, but what does that look like in terms of um, data 
again here in the United States from uh, 10 year period 1998 to 2008, a little bit dated again, but here's some information that we have. We're looking at different produce types and I've highlighted some of the produce types that have higher numbers uh, than other squares or other cells in the table, and then particular pathogens that those are associated with. So we see salmonella highlighted a couple times here with leafy greens and tomato products, norovirus um, with leafy greens, fruits and vegetables, and then pathogenic E. coli um, here with leafy greens. Um, you may remember it is you know, it's a quite a while ago now, but one of the first times many of us were thinking about produce um, was an outbreak linked to cantaloupe in 2011. Jensen Farms in Colorado, we had 147 people ill, um, over 28 states and three, uh, 33 deaths related to that. All right, more recently, so I wanted to just prime the pump and just get you thinking, um, not only again gardening, but let's just think about produce in general. So when between December of 2021 and January of 2022, um, we've got some ongoing outbreaks uh, that the FDA is investigating. There are three currently. We have packaged salad by Dole or Fresh Express. There are 13 states involved in these outbreaks, including Iowa, Ohio, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. I tried to pick out those that were um, from the, the Midwest. I noticed we had some people registering um, for today um, that are in, in Canada. Canada also has an ongoing outbreak um, that they're um, looking at in terms of produce. The one that's um, where the FDA in the United States is looking at it. We've had 17 illness and illnesses and 13 of those have ended up in the hospital. That's a very high hospitalization rate. There have been two deaths, one just um, last week, the second one just last week, uh, um, one, uh, two deaths and the, um, one has been in Wisconsin. So because we're in the grocery store and then we're gonna think about our gardens. But I do want to point out the information when we do see these recalls, especially this time of year when a lot of the produce that we're consuming may be from the grocery store, you're gonna find a lot of good information on the package. If it's a packaged product like these leafy greens, there's gonna be a best if used by date. That's something that the, um, the uh, regulators will ask us to look for. That's one way we'll track those items. And then there's also going to be some kind of code dating that's going to um, that's going to clue us in that it's that it's particular product from a particular facility. Um, and I noticed recently when I was purchasing some lettuce, it actually told me where that lettuce was from. It was from uh, Yuma. And so they were tr tracking that it was right there uh, for you to see. So uh, it's in the news um, more than some of us would like to see, but it is there and um, there, there are ways for us to be um, smart consumers. Why does this happen? Well, um, because there are often microorganisms on fresh produce, they're coming from lots of different places. We consider based on any food product, whether it be a vegetable, fruit, or an animal-based product, that soil and water are the two primary sources of microorganisms on, uh, on, on the food that we consume. Um, and animals can, can contribute as well. Humans can contribute. Um, and then there's other things in the, in the harvesting processing. But soil and water are the two primary um, sources. So before we um, get too far into what I want to talk about today after I've set the stage is, do you think it's possible for homegrown produce to be contaminated with harmful bacteria or viruses? What do you think? Yes or no? Put that in the chat, if you will. Okay, I've got a couple questions. I'm going to read a couple off and then um, what is the is a bigger public health concern for fresh fruits and vegetables? Is it is it um, pesticide residues or do you think it's harmful microorganisms? Which do you think? And I'll try to follow the chat as long as we as, as I'm looking. What do you think? Is organic produce safer than conventional produce? This is a true false statement. 
All right, I'm asking you to think of, of three things. What do you think about homegrown produce and contamination? Yes or no? What about um, public health concerns? Do we think pesticides are more problematic or harmful microbes? And what do we think about organic produce and whether that's safer than, safer than what I'm gonna call conventional produce? That produce that might uh, either in our home gardens or um, uh, elsewhere might not might be grown with more conventional uh, methods, not using organic practices. All right, we've got some really good responses. Um, thank you for that. I wish I'd had a way to really um, give a some kind of a polling slide. I should have done that to see what we're thinking, and then we could record that. Let me show you some data that we have from. Um, over 800 gardeners. Um, this is again from 2004, um, but, but let's see what people were saying. So we know that gardeners actually at that point didn't understand that their garden produce could be contaminated with harmful bacteria and viruses. The scope might be different, but we do have to realize that what we're seeing nationally could be something that we do need to take care of in our home gardens as well, especially because the people who are eating what we grow are the people we really care about. Um, chemical residues from pesticides were viewed as the biggest concern in this group of, of, of 800 gardeners. And there's plenty of data that shows that this is not, from a public health standpoint, is not a significant risk. Um, pesticides are often a concern and we might uh, use different practices as a result in our home gardens, but pesticides are not leading to these illnesses and certainly not the deaths that we're seeing um, linked to um, microbial foodborne illnesses. Many gardeners didn't use best composting practices, and that's really unfortunate. It's something we can do and we do need to control, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Gardeners thought that organically grown produce was safer than conventionally grown fruits and vegetables. And, and some of you have, um, have responded in the chat, I, I've interested uh, to note. Um, we, we have plenty of data to, suggest, to say that this is not the case. Organic is not safer. Um, consumers often think of that um, because of the different um, practices that may be in place in organic operations but organic really is a is a it's an it's an agronomic and agricultural practice in terms of the inputs that we might use uh, for those produce items but it doesn't mean that they're any uh, safer it's still possible to contaminate organic lettuce in the in the processing operation to get those bag salads um, that we all uh, find very convenient so it, it doesn't those don't equate as much as we might um, think that they do. Uh, and gardeners did not consider water a source of harmful bacteria. And I, I kind of gave that away a little bit before when I indicated that soil and water contaminate were primary ways in which uh, food sources might be um, contaminated. All right, so we're gonna look at the continuum and just hit some highlights. What are some really easy, food safety practices um, that we can think about as we're moving into the gardening season that we can think about we're in, we're in the grocery store. Um, we're going to look a little bit at growing uh, and, and that'll tie in with some of Tom's great comments last week. Um, we're going to talk just a, briefly about harvesting and then I did want to spend a little bit of time on handling and storage because this is where you know we've spent all this time, as I mentioned earlier, on 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 growing uh, healthy fruits and vegetables, and so we'd like to have those available. We'd like them actually to be healthy, and part of that is the fact that they're safe for us to consume, uh, for our families to consume, and perhaps to share with neighbors and uh, those kind of things. So let's dive into the growing part. And this is what ties a little bit with last week. So a review of some of the important things we're going to spend just a little bit on looking at these things in a slightly different lens. Healthy gardens grow safe and healthy produce. So we're gonna look at location and where we might think about location from a food safety standpoint. Um, Sun uh, is important. Sun actually has a has an antimicrobial effect. We're going to look at uh, drainage uh, within the garden. We're going to look at uh, watering done right. Tom talked about that last time. I made notes for my own home garden as I listened last week. Um, we're going to look at that um, and then preventing pests. 
something we talked about last week and um, how those are all important, not for all, uh, not only for the, for the growing quality of the pro produce, but the safety of the product that we might harvest for a healthy and bountiful harvest. So good gardening practices as we think of those with the food safety lens. Um, we actually face on a smaller scale um, much of the same challenges that those growers do that are growing acres and acres of produce. We want a, a good growing location, we want safe and healthy soil, we want safe water, and we do need to prevent uh, contamination as much as is, is in our power. And we face some of the challenges for doing all of these. So let's look at location. So Tom was talking about sunshine and those kind of things. And here, those are important as well. Um, your uh, fruits and vegetables have their own ability to fight, fight off pests. And um, so we want to, to have those just as we want to be healthy, the healthier we are, the more likely we're able to fight off an illness. The same will be true of um, fruits and vegetables. So grow them in a sunny garden location with well-drained soil. So I was interested last week with some parts of the upper Midwest, and uh, certainly I think uh, Tom was mentioning about the Dakotas does, don't get as much rain. In Wisconsin, we're very behind on rain this year, and I'm interested to see how that's going to impact our growing season for our gardens. Um, but when we have had in the recent past, we've had these rain events, which might bring like 18 to 20 inches in a weekend. And we just can't deal with that. Uh, we've had it happen in June. We've had it happen in August. Those are the two months that tend to, we tend to see these events. So when we end up with, um, with a, I took this, this picture on a bike ride. My husband and I love to bicycle. Um, we were outside uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where I live. And, and these were, these were um, fields where um, our some of our farm market growers uh, were using this land. And when we see rain that uh, we, we see fields with water that's pooled like this, um, that water transfers bacteria from perhaps uh, an animal operation nearby. It also um, transfers it might from an overflowing stream and, and so not a, a safe water source for drinking, that kind of thing. So, so these are things to be aware of. Do you don't want to necessarily be downhill when you, when, if you are, you want to make sure that the soil drains. So try to like locate your garden away from animal waste storage. Again, water being able to move things from, from one location to another so you can find um, produce and contaminated. And that's such so unfortunate. We do want to keep animals out of the garden. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, to specifically and test soil for nutrients and heavy metals. This is really important and most important we find if, if there's um, reclaimed land that is being used. If this land has been in your family and, and you know the history, um, this isn't as important. But if, you're, if, you're, if there's a community garden area where we've, we would recommend that those gardeners then test their soil, specifically nutrients are good, then you'll know what if the soil is going to support effectively a garden in that area. But heavy metal contamination can be important for more of our um, of our urban gardens where we might be reclaiming land for gardens and and you want to make sure plants can accumulate nutrients including heavy metals and that can mean that the produce itself is um, not safe. So if a flooding event does happen, you find yourself in this situation, I recommend that you contact your extension office, those of us in Wisconsin, hopefully those calls would come to me through our local um, educators, um, the same with the states where you may live, um, because extension educators can help you kind of think about is the produce that you have uh, safe uh, to consume. All right, healthy soil grows healthy produce. So not only the location, the, the, the soil itself. So healthy soil, rich in organic matter. Tom had some great um, tips for us last week about that. Here's where we talk about composting. So composted plant or animal waste. Proper composting is really important. Um, proper composting will actually destroy things like salmonella uh, that may be on um, produce um, that maybe it's rotted or something like that. And so you're composting that. So proper composting will, um, will deal with that. Um, proper composting of uh, will also um, 
help to uh, prevent the spread of disease. So if you compost plant material from your garden, like my husband and I do, um, we'll compost, we'll take cabbages out and we'll take the outer leaves off uh, because they're soiled and, and maybe there's some, uh, often some worms there. And we'll just compost those right in our, in our own plot or we might take them to the compost uh, pile. Um, proper composting are going to destroy um, the some of the, the organisms that might be there that are also plant diseases. Um, uh, so it will help to prevent the spread of that. Locate your compost bins, again, away from the garden so that you don't get um, uh, leach Leach, leakage or leaching from your um, compost bin into your garden. Properly composted organic matter reaches 150 degrees for five days. And I know some states do have a master composter program. We have one in Wisconsin, and those are great places to learn more about proper composting. Okay, water for your garden. This is, uh, again, something Tom talked really effectively about uh, not using foliar application of water, especially at certain times of the day, it spreads disease. It's not healthy for the plants. Drip irrigation is really great. Um, people like uh, my husband and I have a small garden. We garden in a community garden area, which I love because it's very social. Um, so we just find ourselves watering with watering cans. Um, um, that we just bring into our uh, bring into our plot, but watering at the roots is what you want to do. You do want to choose safe water sources. So, city water, well water, rainwater are all good sources. Um, different variations of how those might be treated, so that you know um, you can use that. Um, Sometimes you're using water from a stream and those kind of things. If possible, I, we, it, we will note here, choose potable water. So this is drinkable water for watering late season crops. So, you know, the type of water that you use gets more and more important the later we get in the season. And um, the, the fact that there's solar radiation, the fact that things are outside, all of these environmental factors can help us in destruction of, of pathogens um, like salmonella or thing that may end up on the produce um, may be coming from water. So late in the season is when this is more important um, than it frankly is early in the season where we just know we'll have that time outside in the elements that can help with some of that pathogen destruction. So when you have a choice to make um, and water supply is perhaps limited or you're trying to figure out it's most important late, as you can imagine, um, late in the year, uh, late in the growing season, when you want to make sure that you're, um, that you're using water, if possible, that's potable. It's not always possible. And so when that's the case, don't stress about it, right? But just be more aware than you might have been about the quality of that water, as well as the other things Tom talked about last week. Hand washing. <laughs> I just can't talk about hand washing enough, and, and I know we get tired of hearing it, but hand washing is important. I, I show you here on the right, the upper right image, this is one of the hand washing stations, the garden where I go, uh, grow, um, where we created um, at the start of the pandemic in order for those of us to be able to still gather together and because hand washing has been important throughout the pandemic. Um, we were scrubbing in and scrubbing out of the garden. And um, that tied to other things has meant some of us are healthier than we have been uh, in, in prior years um, because we haven't had the colds and all these other kind of things that we might have associated with. Heart, uh, hand washing is also good because we carry uh, diseases. We, we, we can transfer uh, plant diseases on our hand from crop to crop. We also can carry some human diseases. About 20% of us carry certain um, diseases that can cause foodborne illness on our hands. So it's a great idea to scrub in and scrub out of the garden if you're at all able to. Here's a more um, standard, um, just using a carboy with water to scrub in and out of a garden. 
um, that took a picture of that as well. So steps to clean your hands. You've all heard this before. Wet your hands with clean water and apply soap. Scrub well for 20 seconds. Rinse and dry with a paper towel. In this particular setup here in our garden, you just kind of shake the water off. <laughs> there's no paper towels available. There's a bar of soap right here. Um, and there's water that's coming out of a little pipe that's right here. It is okay in gardening because that's often going to be a little bit easier, especially if water isn't available where you garden, use hand sanitizer. It's not um, as effective in all cases. Um, it's better than nothing. And it's actually more effective in some cases. So hand sanitizer is perfectly acceptable. Just wipe your hands together and let that um, out. Those are generally alcohol based and let them evaporate and off you go um, into the garden. All right. Another step for um, for for produce safety when we think about this these cleaning steps um, have to do again with the tools that we use, and we're thinking of soil and water as transferring these um, potentially harmful organisms to things that even are, might be in our own garden. So ways that we can um, keep our produce safe that we grow is don't let a lot of soil organic matter build up on the on your shovels, on your hose, on your rake. So um, scrape that off um, with a tool that you might have, a trowel or something. Uh, if you have water available, it's great to, to rinse things off uh, before you store them prior to the next use. Again, another thing about tools that are clean is tools can transfer diseases. The soil that's um, they are caked on your shovel can transfer disease from your potentially tomatoes to your potatoes and those kind of things. So clean tools, again, are part of that safe and healthy produce and the plants potentially themselves also being safe. Um, it's a great idea that containers used for harvesting um, are clean. And if you want to sanitize, sanitizing is an extra step. We do we we sanitize after we clean, and here's the steps to sanitizing if you choose um, to use that. In a community garden like for I garden, where we'll notice there's some often tomato blight starts in one plot, and we're worried about spreading that to um, other plots, and we might share harvest containers. Um, we're definitely cleaning and sanitizing because we just don't want to spread uh, those diseases from plot to plot. So sanitizing steps, you will clean with soap and water to start with. We need to basically remove the organic matter that's there. Then we're going to rinse with clean water. And if you have like a shovel at the end of the garden season, the garden where we garden has a garden work day. These are wonderfully social and lots of fun events. And we're going to dip uh, our trowel, our um, shovels and rakes and those kind of things in these big buckets or troughs with the dilute bleach solution. And then we just let them, we hang them up to dry. We just need 30 seconds. These dilute bleach solutions would be one tablespoon of regular bleach per gallon of water. Don't have the bleach scented, just regular bleach. That's a little harder to find these days. We're more often to find concentrated bleach, or they might call it ultra bleach. Um, then you use two and a half teaspoons. Use a little bit less because there's more chlorine which is, oh, excuse me, which is the active ingredient for that. So that's cleaning and sanitizing for um, safe and healthy growing and safe and healthy harvest as well. Talk about animal control, and then we're going to move to harvest. So animals can be source of damage to crops. Uh, these right here, the top picture, the, the picture here on the left, those are the beets from my garden. <laughs> we had tried fencing, and I don't know what happened, but um, yep you can the the animals they can just they enjoy what you're growing as as much as you do and sometimes more i think so um this can be a source of contamination so when we see this we don't want this because i grew those beets for me <laughs> i love pickled beets which was the reason i grew them um, so I don't want to see this for that reason. I also don't want there to be um, any contamination that's transferred from the animals into my garden. So we try to prevent 
uh, animal access as much as possible. Keeping weeds under control is a good thing. Um, we've in my garden, we use uh, a lot of mulching. That's what we've chosen to use. Um, keep weeds under control. That mulch can also harbor sometimes uh, rodents specifically. So there's a balance there. There's no doubt about that. Um, Place your garden in an open, sunny location. This is back to the, our first um, slide where we were talking about reviewing some things from last time where location does matter. And add barriers such as fences when possible. I know when we're talking with, with growers and talking about produce safety from those who might have acres and acres, and also talking with those farmers about trying to keep you know, pests, animal pests out of their fields. It's impossible, right? It, we, it, isn't, it just isn't gonna happen. You're not going to be able to fence acres and acres and acres that we have um, of, of farm crops. It, we, we, we have to deal with this. But those of us who have um, garden plots, sometimes it, it is possible. And where possible, this is what we wanna do, add barriers such as fences. I think I must have the smartest um, animals <laughs> Of, in all of the gardening world because they seem to be able to evade some of these defenses that we put up. But it's a good idea um, to take care. Um, we have deer in the gardens where I am and, and they like to, you know, just basically lean over the fence and um, into things. So we tend to plant things towards the edges of our garden plot um, that the deer won't like, that they won't uh, consume. They love peas. So we have definitely moved the peas away um, from that. So something to think about, again, these um, areas where these where pathogens uh, may be coming into your garden, it's pretty varied. All right. Just briefly about harvest, and then I've got another question for you here. So if we're thinking specifically about harvest and safety, we're, it's a quality issue too, but safety and quality go hand in hand. So avoid harvesting after a heavy rain. Certainly those uh, significant rain events, but um, produce that is um, that moisture will allow um, will allow for um, uh, for pathogens to grow and potentially proliferate. I'm just looking before I go any further. I see a great question from Alexis about pets in the garden. Yes, you do want to keep your pets out of the garden. Cats carry toxoplasmosis. Um, which is a, it's a parasite. Um, pregnant women are specifically susceptible uh, to toxoplasmosis. So you do wanna keep pets when at all possible. Um, pets in many families are like children and sometimes better behaved than children. But um, if possible, do keep your pets uh, out of your garden. Yeah, whenever possible. So that's a great question. Um, again, harvesting, again, for, not only quality, but safety, things that are gonna, that are gonna last long in your refrigerator or on your, in your um, perhaps a, a storage area that you have at home. Um, use clean hands and clean tools. Again, those can transfer diseases even in the harvesting process. Harvest into clean containers. Don't make things you know, that you've spent all this time growing potentially unsafe. Rinse in clean water to remove soil only. We'll talk about that as well. Allow to dry. So don't bring these, don't take these beautiful tomatoes that probably aren't gonna have soil all over them and wash them in the garden and bring them home and expect them to last in your refrigerator because the more moisture we have, the more likely they are to decay. Sort as you go. You do want things though that aren't gonna, um, that are better destined for the compost bin. Um, put those there. Um, rotting, diseased, heavily damaged, just don't bring those inside. Find a, a compost bin that you can put those in um, and uh, uh, use those to fertilize the next year's crop. Uh, time the harvest to maximize quality. This is a standard gardening practice um, for, for quality. It's also good for safety. What's going to allow pathogens to grow um, or moisture, perhaps from a morning dew that's on produce items, those will also compromise quality as well. Avoid the heat of the day whenever possible. That's going to stress the plant, stress uh, potentially the fruits and vegetables um, as well, and to sort produce by type for ease of storage. And I'm going to get into a lot of detail about that here. But let me ask you before we get into this, what are we going to do with all this? 
that we so enjoy eating because you can eat all of it all at once as much as we'd like to. What is your favorite crop to harvest? I'd love to see ours is potatoes. My husband has always grown potatoes. I didn't grow up growing potatoes. I grew up in the South. Um, so what we grew sweet potatoes if we grew anything. Um, but my husband loves potatoes because um, it's magical. You never know what's gonna you're gonna find. Oh, tomatoes. Well, actually, true. There is nothing better than a garden tomato. Um, it, it, I'm sorry, what's in the grocery store just can't. Um, definitely tomatoes. Peas. People are saying peas. Um, those are those are great too. Melons. You know, when you sometimes get a melon, especially if there's a little bit of heat and it's warm, that's it's and you can carry those around. Those are great. Um, people do said only herbs, maybe. So it it yeah. You might have different things. All right. So we're going to transition to we've got safe produce and we've got it super healthy because you've chosen, done all the things right in your garden. Let's think about keeping those healthy and safe for us once we get them home, right? One of the first tips is to plan ahead, right? So this is going to relate to some of the varieties that Tom talked about last week. Unless you're prepared to deal with all of those tomatoes coming in at all of them at exactly the same time, perhaps you're going to preserve that produce in some way for the winter, um, maybe stagger, right? When you're putting things in the garden because you, so you can, you can stretch out that harvest season. Um, with that plan ahead also the time of day you know look at your schedule those are all both important um, storage for safety and quality so we're going to talk about that and then i'm also going to highlight so julie did talk earlier um, today as she introduced this topic that in a couple weeks she's going to talk about let's not waste food from storage to composting so um, that'll be a good idea a good chance to pick up additional tips too. all that garden produce as well as other things keeping it safe and healthy and then later on uh, in the series, preserving the bounty of the harvest. We're not going to talk about that today, but many of us are home canners. Um, we have uh, freezers that are full at the end of the harvest season. So some of those tips will be coming up later in the series, too. So certainly think about that. Just a reminder here real quick, we'll get into some details. You don't need fancy storage containers. When when you look on the website uh, for just some images, you know, I saw these. Yeah, it looks kind of nice. Nice, looks pretty, that's for sure. Um, but you don't need anything fancy. Um, generally, uh, plastic uh, storage containers, many of us are using uh, plastic. There are specific produce storage bags you can purchase as well, but it doesn't really have to be fancy. Um, things that you can do um, to help that will be, you know, how you store them and where you store them. And that's our next, we're going to start into that topic here. Let's get the scoop on plant metabolism. So for those of you who, like me, um, uh, we eat some meat in my home, we don't eat a lot, um, but we're, we're not vegan or certainly not vegetarian by any means. Um, but those of you who like me do eat meat and sometimes people will tell you, oh, that it's just terrible to eat meat, right? Um, because of that, we need to remember that unlike meat, plant tissues are still breathing. <laughs> They're respiring after harvest, right? Animal, this is not true with a beef animal or with a hog that we might slaughter. This is true of produce. So we like to paint the picture that produce is breathing or respiring as you place it in the boiling water to cook it for supper. <laughs> it's screaming at you. So plant material up until the time that it's consumed or cooked is respiring. It goes through respiration. In this respiration process, glucose, which is a sugar uh, that's in plant cells, is combining with oxygen just as when we breathe, we use oxygen. And as a result, carbon dioxide, water, and heat energy are all produced. Um, so fruits and vegetables, we bring them out of the field. And this is why harvesting in the middle of the day is, such, is so bad, because just as we get hot and we can pant, and our animals, our dogs, if you take a dog for a walk, it's going to pant as, you, um, as it's hot. 
vegetables can kind of do that too. They're going to be respiring more actively um, the later in the day. They'll be producing more carbon dioxide, losing more water, and um, producing heat as they're, they're trying to basically cool off a little bit. Um, so temperature is important to control this respiration reaction. The cooler the temperature, um, the slower this rate of respiration um, will be. Um, so that said, that's plant respiration in a nutshell. Um, and there's whole courses at universities on plant respiration. Another thing we do want to think about, though, is in this um, respiration process. Um, so here we go, time after process and relative rate. So generally, once we harvest, this respiration rate is going to drop. You'll see that here on the graph. There are, however, um, some fruits and it's only fruits, some fruits that have this burst of respiration um, at the end of their life. They're going towards what we call senescence, which is plant death. When they're in this burst of respiration towards the very end of their life, they also release a gas known as ethylene. Ethylene is a plant hormone. This is natural for these plants to do this. But there are certain other plants, uh, tissues that respond to this ethylene. So they give it off as just they give off this ethylene gas as just it's natural for them to do this. Apples are a great example. Apples are climacteric fruits. They're going to give off this burst of respiration. As they do that, they're going to give off this ethylene gas. So this ethylene gas, when it's trapped in a storage container, accelerates ripening of other things. So climacteric fruits that give off ethylene are tomatoes, avocados, apples, pears, peaches, kiwis, bananas, and melons. So these are all going to give off this burst of respiration, and they're going to um, they'll give off this ethylene. All fruits and vegetables, to some degree, will respond to this ethylene that is given off. So what we place and what its nearest neighbor is in our crispers, if it's in the refrigerator, can be really important um, because of this ethylene gas and this respiration. OK, so produce storage is like Goldilocks, right? And the three bears. It wants it just right, not too hot, not too cold, and potentially not in with some nearest neighbors as well. So generally the 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 general the general summary that we have, temperature and humidity are key. If we want to keep produce um, delicious, not only safe, but really high quality after after we've harvested it because of this respiration reaction. We want to be aware of these heat and water. And then we're going to say, where is the next slide? Right. So we want to package to retain the fact that the water is going to be given off. We're towards the end of winter, but, you know, in a closed car in the winter, if there are a lot of people breathing in that car, what happens to the windows in the car, right? They fog up. My husband looks at me, Barb, would you stop breathing because you're fogging up the windows? Well, I can't do that, and neither can the plants. So sometimes you can actually see this moisture being um, given off as plants respire. We'll notice if we package them really tightly in a plastic bag, you might notice moisture collecting. Um, so we want that moisture to be collected. It creates some humidity, and that's good for things not drying out. Too much moisture collection, however, and things are going to mold. They're going to deteriorate because spoilage bacteria and yeast and mold are going to want that moisture that will encourage growth. So it is a kind of a balance there. Um, with water, the heat, the heat of the heat um, issue is the fact that lower temperatures generally will slow respiration. So we just are going to get a longer storage life out of the produce that we have. There'll be quality produce for longer. So we're generally placing things in a cool environment um, and with some kind of package. Really, the type of package is up to you. You'll see some hints in in a couple of slides on what uh, what the, what those hints might be. So before we we do that, I'm, we've got a table for you and uh, we'll get you the um, 
the URL so you can print this table off if you want if you'd like. There are certain things that cold is not good. These are really the prima donnas of the produce world. They're often linked to um, to more tropical in origin um, um, uh, fruits uh, that we have. And this is we've all seen chill injury, right? We can see it in bananas, right? It, if you put bananas in the refrigerator just because they're maybe browning too fast. It's not a problem. You can still eat the bananas, but but you're, they're going to take on this brown mottled appearance. And what happens with these um, items that are susceptible to chill injury is the enzymes. I'll go back for one thing. The enzymes that catalyze this reaction, that make this reaction possible, when it's too cold, they they just go haywire. They they're it's your plant tissues just basically break down, and it's it's basically uh, the tissues breaking breaking down in the like in the skin of the banana. It's okay. It's still safe to consume. It just doesn't look as good, uh, for sure. It makes great banana bread when you store them cold too long because they'll soften. So sometimes we see chill injury in the garden. You know, if you if uh, things are late in the season, but Often we see them when we're storing them at home in the wrong location. Um, there's some things that are pretty susceptible. Sweet potatoes, you'll notice browning right away. Um, cucumbers, they're going to get that watery pitted look if they're in a temperature. You put them in the crisper in your refrigerator, and I do this myself, um, but you'll notice chill injury or spots of chill injury. Same thing for eggplant. You'll see the darkening of that skin. Tomatoes. Tomatoes lose flavor, uck. Yeah, they just don't taste the same. And that's a symptom of uh, chill injury. Asparagus, the same, uh, and green beans. It's not to say that we don't use um, our vegetable crispers, but it just means that once we place them in that location, they're just not gonna maybe be the same. They won't last as long. So chill injury, it, there's a balance between lowering the respiration rate for these fruits and vegetables versus the fact that you're gonna notice these symptoms of chill injury. Pitting and softening, loss of flavor, failure to ripen. It's harmful to the plants. We can certainly consume anything that's been chill injured. We sometimes just may wanna trim that area out. Um, it may, we may just notice some tissue damage uh, underneath. All right, so here is a um, quick guide. Use your computers, uh, recommended storage for fresh fruits and vegetables. The one I'm recommending here is from University of California, Davis. And you'll notice there's storage locations for vegetables, fruits, and melons. And you'll have different um, um, options store in the refrigerator from the get-go. Harvest those in your, um, in your garden and go ahead and bring those straight into your uh, refrigerator. Um, then there's those that actually like to, to ripen on the counter, our second category, and then to store at room temperature. So I put a little asterisk there, the blue star refrigerated storage will help deter spoilage, quality is going to suffer when these go that really like to ripen and then you put them in the refrigerator or actually you start off being better stored at room temperature. Again, um, we, we put them in the refrigerator. We cannot generally eat as much as we have all at once, um, but, but there will be some loss of quality, but it is a quality issue uh, when that happens. Uh, all cut, peeled, and trimmed items should be refrigerated. So once you cut into it, uh, this is for safety. We do need to store those things um, in the refrigerator. All right. So for quality and safety overall, we don't want to rinse produce prior to putting it in the into storage. Um, whether it's on the counter or in the refrigerator, unless we're removing field field um, heat uh, for that. And I see Scott put in the chat function, I believe he put the, the URL for that chart that I just had up there. Package to maintain moisture, but not too much moisture. So that might mean poking some holes um, in, a, in a storage uh, container or a storage bag that you have. Refrigerate all cut, peeled, and trimmed fruits. This is to ensure quality, um, to ensure safety. Um, sort, sort, and sort again. So, you know, we find things in the back of the crisper that we didn't realize we have, but you'll benefit certainly from being able to enjoy those items if you sort things and make sure that you're removing molded items and rinse and clean water prior to eating or preparing. 
Uh, just remember that a rinse in water is, is good, um, it's recommended, but it cannot be counted on to ensure something that's unsafe. So if you have a flood event and you bring, bring in produce and say, well, I'll just rinse it before I eat it or prepare it, that absolutely is no guarantee um, that the produce items will be safe. All right, with that, I have motored and I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but um, Julie may have some for us and uh, we just thank you for your time today. As you can see, there's some, some topics coming up that will build on this and we'll have a lot more information for you as we continue the series. So I do have a few questions for you. Okay. Are some store brands distributed by Dole or Fresh Express? So um, if there is a recall where, yes, uh, so large, uh, actually um, Dole may be, a, Dole is a, is a brand just as Kroger would be or um, um, something like that. And so generally what happens in the food industry is there's a large processor uh, that's processing a lot of things and then they're just going to take and put the same product into lots of different bags depending on who they're packing for. So it is, it is quite common that Dole product, maybe it may be a Dole facility that you'll find that in a different brand. So you have to keep be aware of recall notices. They will specify um, what to look for on that package. All right. So now you have another question on lettuce. If it says it's been washed three times, should we wash oh. it again? And well, are actually, there any cleaning agents that are effective? That's a great question. So the recommendation for triple wash lettuce is not to wash it at home. There is evidence that we actually tend to spread contamination, um, especially if you wash it directly in the sink. Um, so because other things have been in that sink. Um, so you don't need to do that. The best thing with any kind of leafy green is just make sure that you're aware of recalls because when they're happening, they're generally happening pretty broadly. Um, and so those are people like me who limit uh, leafy greens that we consume. It's they're almost invariably from the garden. Um, I eat a lot of celery salads this time of year. Um, recently, I did buy a package of mixed greens uh, with misgivings. My daughter was visiting and she loves lettuce. So I just I did that for her. Um, but I don't eat things that I don't leafy greens that I don't grow uh, almost invariably. Yeah. So these are choices we're making. It's a pretty we just have to be more aware of where our food is coming from than we maybe did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Great so I question. Have a, I have a question about water and some people use well water. And yep. the question is about arsenic and well water. Should you use it? Is it okay? So that's a great question and, and probably public health in your area. So plants can concentrate certain things like arsenic. So um, if you're worried about that, if that's something that you're aware might be a ca the case, you could certainly, I would recommend that you have your water tested. Um, if that's the case, then I would say work with a local extension um, agent to see certain plants tend to concentrate these, these um, metals more than others. I know rice is one. We don't don't usually grow rice in our gardens, but um, you might be able to use that well water uh, more comfortably um, if you know a little bit more about uh, the types of plants you're growing, how those respond to arsenic that may be in the soil, but it would be definitely be worth checking. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. Is the produce section of the grocery store a good example to follow of what should be refrigerated and what shouldn't be refrigerated? in lieu of chill injury? Um, that's a great question. Um, I hadn't thought about that before, but I, I would say, yeah, you probably have a good idea there. You know, the, the, the grocery stores generally are, are not uh, keeping things on the shelves for very long. So um, they're, they're kind of transient. So if, if things can stay out at room temperature, you'll notice tomatoes, avocados are susceptible to chill injury. You'll notice those are sold at room temperature, um, asparagus as well. So generally, yes, um, things that are, are, that are outside of the refrigerator, um, that would be a great place to hold them or think about um, holding them once you get them home. Uh, just time for a couple questions because the uh, 
chimes are going off at NDSU. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Due to COVID, this person says that they wash uh, vegetables with salt and white vinegar and store in the refrigerator to last longer. Do you have any commentary on use of vinegar washes or salt or anything like that? So salt will not be antimicrobial at the level at which we use it. So you can do it, but it, it won't be effective. Um, it actually may pull water out of the produce, and that means it's going to go limp more rapidly. So probably not a great idea. There is some evidence, and that's one of the things my group is working in, on, or these organic acids. Um, vinegar will work. It also changes the color of uh, and can change the flavor. So it, it's not harmful to use any of these or produce wash solutions you find in the grocery store. Um, Really, the best thing you can do is grow things safely or make good choices at the grocery store. Um, And then you don't need to do these other things. The problem with rinsing is you're introducing water. So you might be trying to combat um, pathogens, but then you're going to things are going to spoil more rapidly. So um, with that. Here's your final question. And before I tell you your question, I want to thank you and thank all of our participants today. Uh, It's been a really informative session. So final question. A few years ago, packaged leafy greens were contaminated by wild pigs, and it was rumored that the E. coli had actually been absorbed into the lettuce roots and could not be washed off. Is that true? So there was an outbreak. It was linked to animal husbandry and uh, growing conditions. Um, And we do know that plants are able to internalize uh, pathogens less through the roots, um, more likely through stomates uh, openings on the leaf where they do this breathing uh, for that. Um, So it is true. You can't wash it off. So we would tell everyone to rinse things prior, only prior to eating or preparing, but uh, don't rely on rinsing with clean water as a way to make something safe, like, because it's not necessarily going to happen, probably won't. Um, With that, I also need to remind people, Julie, that there's an evaluation, right? To remind people to please fill out the evaluation after today. Um, Those of us who are privileged to be part of Julie's series um, would like her to get the evaluation information she needs because we know we've enjoyed uh, presenting and hope that you have enjoyed uh, listening as well. So So in the evaluation went into the chat right there. So if you aren't, if you're still on with us, uh, click that link and um, give Julie that evaluation data with that. Well, thank All you right. very much, Barb. And thanks again to everybody. We hope to see a lot of you next week to learn more about honey. And then I'll be the next week after that. So Barb has given me a lot of good things to consider to maybe add to my presentation as well. So thanks everybody. And thank you, Barb. Mm-hmm.